Hello again, art history students. Welcome to the uh, next lecture, which is the last one in uh, this unit. Today we're going to be talking about Romanesque, Gothic, and sort of medieval artwork, but not necessarily in that order. So this is a map of the area where we are talking about today and where we have been. So we talked about Constantinople and the um, Eastern Roman Empire in a previous lecture. We also talked about Islamic art and we talked about, um, but we waited to kind of talk about what was going on over here in the West. So in the, in this whole time span in Europe is often referred to as the Middle Ages, which means the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Renaissance, this time in the middle, right? This is a time of very decreased prosperity. Um, the Black Death is going to kill one third of the European population. Sometimes this is considered the Dark Ages. And another reason why it's such a time of decreased prosperity is the vacancy of the Roman Empire, the vacancy of a unified leadership. So this early time, just after the Roman Empire kind of recedes from the Western Roman Empire and kind of reestablishes itself in the East, it prospers there. Um, remember, we talked about the Byzantine Empire, right? They consider themselves to be Romans during that time, but this is the time surrounding Constantinople here. So surrounding this area, we talked about Justinian and we talked about the icons and all that kind of stuff. So this area over here in the West was, became a power vacuum, which means that all these other groups are coming in at this time to establish potential, you know, leadership in the area. So some of these words that you may be familiar, like to vandalize something, that comes directly from this group. And when the Romans are the ones that are kind of recording history at this time. So this term barbarian is a Roman term, which basically means people who don't speak Latin. Right? It's people whose language sounds like bar, 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 bar to the Romans. So these groups are coming in, they're on the move, they're on migration, they're not settling down yet. They're very much so, there's a lot of battles. This is not a very good time to be alive, right? It's considered the dark ages. It's not a time of prosperity and light. So we're going to kind of track it all the way from the beginning until um, the end, just before the Renaissance. So during this migration period, a lot of portable art is created. Not a lot of big statues or sculptures are created during this time because of that decreased prosperity. People are on the move, right? And then if you have something valuable, you're not going to want to put it in a big statue where you can't take it with you. Another group might come in and push you out of your homeland or out of your village or whatever the case may be. And you then may have to be on the move as you, the area that you live is being taken over by another group. So this makes for all art becomes a lot more smaller. It becomes quite a bit more portable. So I just answered that question there. All right, first we're gonna talk about um, Hebrew Saxon art. This is from basically art from the British Isles. And we're going to focus on something called codexes, which are handwritten books. So this is the Lindau Gospels. This is the exterior of the book. And I wanted to make sure, I, I really wanted to include this kind of side profile image so you could see just how thick and raised the cover of this book is. Um, so this is essentially a Bible, right? A handwritten Bible. And um, it's encrusted with all these jewels. There's so much wealth on it. If you were to think about one of these other groups that might be coming in, like the Vikings or the Ostrogoths or the Vandals, they're not going to have that same religion. So they're just going to take kind of the cover objects on it. So there's a lot of this wealth kind of 
physically laid on top of it and then you can take it with you if you're the area where you live is you know being kind of overrun this object is very portable right it's very easy to save rather than a giant sculpture or something like that all right so these manuscripts codexes gospels right are written and decorated by hand and they're usually made by a whole variety of people it's not like one individual sits down to do this it's usually done by monks and nuns those were the only um people who could really read and write at this time um oftentimes kings and queens or people with lots of wealth and money most people were illiterate at this time except for monks and nuns this is a very intensive and laborious process it uses a lot of iconography right that's a term that we talked about before and we're going to kind of redefine um, in this lecture today so here we have a vision of hildegard right and she is sort of receiving as she works here on the codex she is sort of receiving this gospel right this vision Right, we see another monk over here in his, he's obviously in his robe. Just to clarify, this is not a toga, right? We're kind of moving out of that time frame. Um, these are monks and nuns working on these codexes. So here is from the Book of Kells. This is one of the like two books that we're going to kind of talk about a little bit more in depth. And this is a what's called a folio page which is basically just a decorated page we're talking about this object over here um, very very intricately decorated and some of the imagery that we see is sort of a blending of the traditional design work from the british isles and kind of that surrounding area of europe specifically the british isles and this new religion right so what this is is the chi ro i put over here this um mosaic of emperor justinian that we talked about in a previous lecture and we talked about this chi ro here which is this x and p kind of shape which is the like c letter and it sort of sounds like christ in the or is the symbol for christ it's only two letters so that's what we see in this image and here also from the book of kells is a page or folio but sometimes the term that's used for these and these represent the four evangelicals right this is matthew who is depicted as a man and then mark as a lion luke which is an eagle and then john which is our john is the eagle i'm sorry and then luke is the ox or the calf now in some of you guys discussions or other things that i've read when you talk about you've used the term iconography before in describing things and um i've read students will say like oh the distant mountains in the background are dark and gloomy and thus that's the use of iconography to set about this image as a you know menacing one or some something along those lines so just to, just to kind of clarify this term there is a symbolic use of imagery right to create a tone or a mood or a feeling within a painting but that is not iconography iconography is a cultural set understanding right unless you knew that this kind of calf ox creature was to represent Luke, right? There's nothing indicating that other than a general understanding by the entire culture, right? There's nothing in Luke's name or something that would kind of be like, oh yeah, that's, you know, Luke the calf or something like that. That's not like that. It's this understood, everyone understands this. And it's because most people are illiterate that iconography thrives at this time. So I'm not trying to like call you guys out that you like use that term wrong. I just wanna make sure I clarify. And this time in history is really the pinnacle of iconography. And mostly because it's very prevalent in Christianity. It is prevalent in other 
um, religions and cultures are something very, very prevalent in Christianity from the Middle Ages when most people are illiterate. All right, this is from the Lindisfair Gospels, right? This is another one of those folio pages that kind of marks the beginning of a, um, like a new book of the Bible, a new, new chapter. So this one actually is talking about Matthew, right? So after this would be the book of Matthew. And then this is also um, from the Lindisfair Gospels. And this is the folio or the page that introduces the book of Matthew, which I thought the last one was. Okay, one thing I want to point out is so we have this obvious imagery of the cross on this page, right? We can see it here. And then the whole background is these amazing kind of birds, right? They're kind of like cranes and they have these super long necks that are swirling and interlocking and biting themselves and biting each other right i love the the appearance of this so this is again that merging of imagery that was previously from this culture right from the british isles kind of merging with the new religion so these are decorative themes that are brought into the artwork for as the artwork is made for this new religion, which is new at this, you know, kind of this time in history. So this is also from the Lindisfair Gospel. All right, so this is the purse lid from Sutton Hoo. This is not a um, Hebrew Saxon artwork. This is an Anglo Saxon artwork, but that's not necessarily super important for you to know. I want you, I put it in here to point out that use of those kind of like Celtic knots is kind of what you probably are familiar with, right? These interlocking woven together shapes, right? We also see some animals and whatnot. So what this is, is this is a purse lid, but it's more like a fanny pack lid. Um, this is where you keep things that were close to you. And again, this is kind of a dangerous time to be alive. So there would actually be a leather flap that would go if you were to wear this object, there would be a leather flap that would kind of go over and cover this beautifully decorated um, purse top or purse lid to kind of keep it, you know, keep it secret, you know, keep your keep your cards close to your chest kind of thing. So this was actually from a burial mound, so, you know, so probably someone who is very wealthy and very important to be buried with this. And there's that still that belief in the afterlife and that you need to take things with you when you go. Okay, so next we're going to move on to what's known as the Carolingian, sometimes it's referred to as the Carolingian Renaissance, but we're going to call it Carolingian artwork just to distinguish this time frame from the Renaissance Renaissance that we're going to talk about in the next unit. <clears throat> so this is art that's made in the time of Charlemagne. So Charlemagne is the uh, leader of what is current day France, right? And he battled the Moors, right? Which were the Islamic forces that came up through Spain. We briefly touched on this during the um, lecture on Islamic artwork, especially when we talked about those kind of Islamic castles, which were kind of self-contained areas that had everything they needed within them. And um, Charlemagne is credited with stopping the spread of Islam into um, Northern Europe or into the rest of Europe. So he's really interested in art, right? Roman art, specifically from the time of Constantine. And that kind of makes sense in context because Constantine was the first Christian emperor or, um, you know, the first Christian leader of anything. So it would make sense that this um king is trying to draw back from that history right so this is one of those illuminated manuscripts one of those folio pages and this was commissioned by charlemagne and um his wife hildegard right so we know that this is saint mark and we know that it's a depiction of him because it has this awesome little lion up here with him the lion has his own halo 
right? So these are representing the same person, but the line is there to let you know if you cannot read that this is Mark, right? So we see a couple kind of things that are very reminiscent of Rome, specifically these Roman sandals that he's wearing. Wait, let's get a color that might stand out a little bit more, right? So he's wearing these Roman sandals. He's wearing a sort of toga type thing, right? And that's that looking to that art of the past and trying to kind of draw on it as they represent these characters which are very important to them or these religious symbols which are very important to them. It's also important to note that there's still kind of that these kind of fern shapes up in here would be a little bit more traditional in the northern European area. All right. So we're seeing a little bit of a decline here. So I put these three um, images together, which are different folios that are similar um, and kind of what's happening as there is this decline in prosperity. So we start off in the eighth century with the artwork that's commissioned by Charlemagne that we just looked at. And as we progress through time to the ninth century, we see some of the same things. This is now St. Matthew. We see those same Roman sandals. We see him in his toga. But there's a lot less decoration going on here, right? There's a lot less um, kind of like time and effort. There's not as much gold being depicted, right? This would be actual kind of gold leaf that would be put behind these halos. Right, so there's not as much use of that. And then by the time we get to the Ebo Gospel of St. Matthew here, which we're going to look at larger in the next slide, we see significant distress. We see significant um, kind of the way in which this is depicted is very quick. It's very sketchy. Think about how much time and effort would have went into that image of St. Mark, right, with all the beautiful details all around the edges, right? This one still has a lot of the same things. So same Roman sandals, right? We see some kind of Romanesque architecture in the background behind him. This horn that he is holding was a very European object. Um, the Romans would not have used this horn to hold ink as they wrote. That's a very European thing. So there's a little bit of like kind of our understanding or the understanding of the people who created this object what they would use to write with and whatnot. But I really want you to pay attention to the face of St. Matthew. It is a face in distress. It is not a like, here I am just sitting in the field writing, you know, no, it is, it is showing the distress of the time, right? And we definitely saw that decline kind of in prosperity, which is something that we've touched on in this class before, um, think back to when we talked about the Joman culture, right? And there's sort of this when prosperity rises, the art rises and the amount of decoration and whatnot. There's a few exceptions and we'll get to those, but this is definitely one of those times when prosperity is decreasing and thus the amount of art, the amount of time which is put into art and the sort of um, the level of craftsmanship is on decline also. All right, so next we're going to move chronologically in time. So the Carolingian time frame then moves to um, the Ottonian time. So the Ottonians kind of view themselves as inheritors or they kind of pick up where the Carolingian artworks left off. So there is definitely this merge of Germanic imagery and Mediterranean imagery. Mediterranean is where Rome is, right, which is where Constantine would have been uh, and the artwork that we're familiar with from that time. So there's still a, a large use of iconography. Um, and there's also kind of this interest in materials and processes that are hearkening back to that Roman Empire. So let's look at some examples of that. This is one of my favorite artworks to look at this class uh, in this class. So this is Otto the first presenting the Cathedral of Magdeburg. And when we talked about the Byzantine Empire, we had that they had that awesome uh, mosaic of 
the Emperor Constantine presenting the city of Constantinople and then Justinian I presenting the Hagia Sophia, right? If you remember, you can always go back and watch it if you don't, um, presenting those buildings to um, Mary and Jesus. So here we see, this is Otto, right? This guy here, and he's holding the church, right? kind of in its original construction. I put this in here. This is the current day image of the Church of um, Magdeburg. So we're kind of talking about the like original structure, which is roughly this kind of area. So we see that here. We see an adult Jesus, right? A kind of a man, and that's a uh, very much so a difference between the Eastern and Western Roman Empire at this time during this Middle Ages period. A lot of depictions of Jesus as a man versus Jesus as kind of a youth or a child. Um, Jesus looks very wise and old, right? This is a time, this is not a positive time in history, and it's very difficult to get people in a time of hardship to look to an infant as um the savior right i don't want to get into that too much but here we've got Otto. so we have this clear use of hierarchical scale so Otto is the smallest here and then these this is one of his ancestors behind him right surrounded by some angels and then um jesus is clearly the largest if he were to stand up right and he's he's touching the um Cathedral of Magdeburg. Another thing to note is that it's made of ivory, which is not, ivory does not usually um, occur naturally in Germany, right? So there's that sending away of mat for materials that are of Mediterranean origin or would be, have, would have been used frequently in the Mediterranean. This is a, another folio page. This is from the Gospels of Otto III, so the grandson of Otto the first and here we see this page with Christ washing the feet of his disciples and so again we're in this very negative hardships for sure um, the people's lives are not full of prosperity and it's interesting that the choice of imagery to depict here is Christ washing the feet of his disciples which is a very a very humble and very giving moment, right? If you don't have very much and you have so much hardship, it's nice to think that someone who you, you would perceive as part of your religion to be sort of better than you, right? They have this halo, they have this spirituality, doing something so humble, right? So there's a, there's a lot baked into which stories are being depicted. Another thing I want to point out is in the background here up at the top, this is a depiction, a rough depiction of the Church of Magdeburg. Now, if you guys remember back when you were maybe in the fourth grade art class, you did the perspective drawing of the railroad tracks that receded into space, maybe, um, if you've ever done anything with linear perspective. So we have this kind of strange not quite linear perspective happening, right? I've put this image in right here, which kind of shows you all of those lines. So it's like the building is receding into space, but yet there's some other weird things that are happening. But what is important is where it's drawing your attention, right? All those lines are intersecting here and then also up here at that cross, right? Drawing your attention to those two things as symbolic messages. Right. So, again, iconography is used a lot in these depictions of these stories. People would be familiar with this story from hearing it, even if they couldn't read it themselves. Another thing I want to point out is these awesome columns here. Right. If you remember way back, those are Ionic columns. So they're definitely drawing from that Roman, Greek and Roman Mediterranean tradition. All right. We see that blessing hand, which we saw before. Then another thing I really love is like, look how many people are packed over onto this side of the image. And yet there's kind of this openness over here. So it's like they're trying to achieve balance 
with everything in the image and then everything just goes boop and like slides to one slide because that's where all the people are. I, I really love, I really love this folio image. I think it's, it's beautiful in so many ways. All right, next we're gonna talk about the Hildersheim doors. So linked above or below this video in Blackboard is another video from um, Smart History that I want you to watch. It's roughly six minutes long. It has a great ability to kind of zoom in and whatnot that I don't really have in these little lecture videos. So there's a couple, I want you to pause and watch it um, here as soon as I'm done talking just for a second. I want you to pause and watch that. Um, pay close attention to the fact that what material this is made of, if Bishop Barnard went on a pilgrimage, that's a term that we threw out there before, and we're going to proceed and talk about more as we move forward in this class. So there's a lot of talk about the material, which is lost wax bronze cast, right, which we remember from our Greek lecture quite a while ago. All right, go watch that now. And you should have watched it, right? So here we have the detail from the Hildersheim door. This is the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And one of the things I want to point out that I I, I really love about this artwork is it's very it's very rough, right? In the fact that, especially if you were to compare and contrast it to those lost wax bronze casts from the Greek period, right? Remember how beautifully intricate they were with all the rings of the beards and there was like little individual toenails and stuff, right? This one's very rough by comparison, but I love that it's broken down by these rectangles, but yet at the same time, it's like the people and the figures and the characters seem to kind of be poking out of it. Like they're kind of these stories that are about to step into our world, right? And that's kind of a theme that that's not by mistake that that toe kind of peeks out or that if you watch the video, there look to be a couple figures that are kind of almost hanging off and out of the door. And they also talked about how it's red in this kind of U shape. It goes down and then over and then back up. So remember the idea that when we think about the order of something, right, we always think about it from right or from left to right, because that's how we read. That's how we would kind of assign um, a time frame, right? But people of this time didn't have that because most people weren't literate. So that's one of the reasons why it kind of takes that odd kind of way in which it's ordered. All right. Hopefully that. All right, so next I want to talk about this queen's ship just for a moment. So this is a Norwegian queen's ship. It was part of a burial for a pagan queen. Right? So the Vikings, which you may or may not be familiar with from popular culture. Right? So this is a polytheistic group that eventually converted to Christianity. So these ships are what would have taken the Vikings from their, their homeland in um, Norway and Sweden area out to explore other areas of the world. And the Vikings went all over the world. They were the first to come to the Americas or the first Europeans to come to the Americas. And um, so it makes sense that this vessel is what they would see as taking them into the afterlife. But I wanna talk about the merging of cultures with the next slide. So this is the exterior and cutaway view of a stave church in Norway. And this is completely made out of wood and it is made to look like a Viking longhouse, which is very similar. The Viking longhouse is kind of made to look like one of those ships with those little kind of thingies that come off of the ends like this, right? But when we look at the interior, you see that there's arches in there in the way it was constructed. So those arches are put there as this kind of blending of this Romanesque Europe and this traditional building, right? The super steep roofs are there with a function and a purpose. It snows a lot in Norway. And if you have anything 
um, kind of like a shallow roof, the snow will build up and then the, the roof may collapse. So the, the super steep roof is part of the function of the building. But those arches inside, they don't they don't serve any purpose. They don't hold the building up better, right? That's something that's made out of stone. This is a wood structure, so it doesn't need that. It's solely there because it's drawing on that Roman tradition, which it is seeing through another European lens. So it's kind of like culture, looking at culture, that's looking at culture, right? This kind of um, piling of ideas on top of each other. And this kind of begins how everything is drawing upon something else in the art world um, almost always. So art is always kind of reaching back and always kind of looking forward to what is best for it then. So that got a little bit philosophical on us. All right, so this also kind of brings us to the next stage of the Middle Ages. So in the early stages of the Middle Ages, there was this power vacuum and it was very it was a very unstable place to live at any moment you could have to move people could be coming into your you know village or land or place that you lived and saying you got to move on because this is our place now right there was a lot of battles a lot of conflict so by the 12th century which is the 1100s things were starting to settle down a little bit there were a little bit of um kind of distinct boundaries of who was in charge of what area and whatnot and things started to get things started to get better there were, were kind of like on upswing of prosperity at this time so this is the Bayou tapestry from 1066 this is one of the this is just before that kind of prosperity happens but it's part of the reason why the prosperity starts to happen so this is from the battle of hastings so i am kind of rare on dates in this class i'm sure you guys have noticed you normally don't see uh test questions that are like what date is this you know when was this created. I think what's more important for you to know is kind of the order in which things come, what came first, what inspired what. Those are the things that I, I want you to take away. But this date is important, and I will tell you that there will be a test question about it. So something else that I want to point out is this image that you see here is the image that was in every textbook I ever um, saw when I was in college and when I was learning about art history and it's a very deceptive image because it looks like this artwork is broken down into registers similar to how ancient egyptian artwork is broken down right we see these kind of like scratches and scuffs right that seem to go from the like that these things sit on top of each other they don't it's one long progression like it's one long panel and it's embroidered and it, the way it is in the museum is it goes all the way around, right? So as you walk along this corridor, right? Or this area here, this isn't like the best image, right? You are kind of being told the story or follow the story of the Battle of Hastings, right? Why they use that other image that I think is confusing. It was confusing for me when I was like starting out studying art history. I totally misinterpret it why they keep using it i don't know but i wanted to share with you kind of um that everybody's got to start somewhere if you find yourself befuddled by something um you know everybody who has been befuddled by something at one time or another so let's look at some of how space is broken down on this very long linear progression um, Okay, so this is multiple scenes. It's meant to be viewed slowly and unravel over time, like I said, with that long horizontal format. It celebrates the victory of William the Conqueror. All right, so let's go to some of these images. All right, so we have this clear horizon line here, right? And we can sort of see fallen soldiers and then the battle that's happening. It's very, very chaotic, right? There's a lot going on. There's horses that are upside down, right? It's a lot um, happening in even just this small 
amount of space. So this is a slide I really wanted to show you guys with the way, so here in this image, right, I know that my head is kind of over top of a part of it. There's this group that's coming along these, these hills, right, and we see those hills depicted in their horses. And then there is a castle which is up on top of a hill. So I love that they just kind of rose this mountain up on top of the, of the sort of line and then we go back to hills right so this very interesting depiction of space and again this isn't about depicting this accurate depiction of the landscape in which this happened this is a storytelling apparatus if you know the story right and you know that this group set fire to the castle right or to this i think it's like a fort like a fortification area right that's what this object is about it's a storytelling apparatus it's not a the accuracy is not what artists are going for at this time right the same way with that image of that folio piece of jesus washing the feet of his disciples right there's that depiction of the church of magdenburg in the background or the cathedral of magdenburg in the background but it's not about accurately depicting it it's about drawing your attention to certain areas and whatnot so keep that in mind as the theme of what medieval art is about all right next we're going to move to romanesque art right which we've kind of been hinting at as a thing all along with the Carolingian artwork and with the Ottonian artwork. It's this drawing on the art of Rome, um, drawing on that, that artistic tradition from the past. So like I said, Europe is growing quite a bit more prosperous, quite a bit more stable at this time, but there's still this emphasis and focus on death and sin and hell, right? There's not this um, prosperity Christianity like we may or may not be familiar, you may or may not be familiar with today. Christianity is very um, dark at this time. So let's look at some of the artworks. First, we're gonna talk about a quick architectural thing, which is a barrel vault which is basically an arch that gets extended into a hallway, which is important for things like these churches, which are being constructed at this time, because the arch is very Roman in its tradition. And then this is kind of an extension of that or an expansion of that as it goes down this long um, church aisle, right, which goes through the center. So this is a perfect example of a vera, uh, of a barrel vault and this is really the only time that you'll see this image so you may see it on the test and may say like what architectural innovation is this remember it's a barrel vault all right so this is a map of europe from the time and i'm going to take the slide out all right so now we're going to talk about pilgrimages in the middle ages when we had the lecture on Islamic art, we focused on pilgrimages to specific places, sites of important religious event. But a pilgrimage is a slightly more general term. It can mean a voyage or a trip for a spiritual connection, right? And that doesn't mean the des what I'm getting at is the destination is not always the end goal. The idea is that the journey is what's important. And in this time, right, Europe is just coming into prosperity. It's just coming into safety and security and settling down. People are not about to voyage to the Middle East. It's very far away. It's very expensive. If you think it's expensive to travel today, imagine if you had to do it on horseback with boats and stuff it was very very expensive to get to those religious lands so what they ultimately did was they brought back what are known as relics which are holy objects or body parts of holy figures and they would bring them from the middle east from the holy land 
back to Europe. Right? These were called the Crusades. So this is the reliquary of Saint Andrew or Saint Alexander. All right. So inside of this object, inside of this metal um, head of a man, is the skull of Saint Alexander. That is the reliquary. So let's step aside for just a moment, kind of out of out of context a little bit, and have kind of a, a, a momentary side discussion. So St. Alexander died in Jerusalem or in Syria in uh, 251 AD. The Crusades, like I said, which was these voyages to the Holy Land in order to bring these objects back, were roughly 1095 to 1492. This reliquary was created almost 1,900 years after St. Alexander of Jerusalem passed away, right? You could say, is it his skull? Isn't it his skull, right? But this is the point I want to make. Does it matter? If it is or if it isn't a real reliquary, a real object which belonged to a religious individual or is the body part of a religious individual, does that matter? If the journey, if the pilgrimage is about the journey and about the spiritual awakening that comes from the journey, does it matter that this object is maybe and maybe not true or real. So I just want to throw that out there as a sidestep for part of what I believe that you should be doing as someone who is learning art history is, is empathizing and trying to contextualize with the people who would have made the object or used the object or seen the object right in its original context. Right? So if you're this early Christian believer, Regardless of what you believe in now, just as kind of a thought experiment, this this pilgrimage is about this journey and the connection, the religious connection that you would receive from the journey. It's not about whether or not this thing is really a thing. Right? So I just want to try to make that point, because I think sometimes these reliquaries can kind of, because there's this this question that they're not real that somehow it devalues it as an art object and I don't want you guys to do that all right we said that this was Romanesque art look how Romanesque it is so I put this image of Augustus of Prima Porta which we talked about the sculpture way back when we had the Rome lecture right this clear connection between um, St. Alexander and Augustus of Prima Porta in the visual face, which is very strange because this is a Christian religious object which is drawing its visual connections from this pagan emperor. It just seems like an odd thing to bring together, but thus that it is what it is. All right, so here are some of those pilgrimage routes. Right. So again, they are happening through this kind of France and the northern part of Spain, a little bit into um, Germany and the British Isles. We kind of have some of their own pilgrimage sites right from these crusades. The ones that we're going to focus on is Santa Foy here and then Chartres Cathedral up here. So as you can see, there are many, many, many of these pilgrimage sites. And this was a very popular thing to do, but we're just gonna focus on two. Santa Foy was one of the earlier ones, and then Chartres is one of the, uh, the architecture changes, and we're gonna talk about that. So this is the reliquary of Santa Foy um, in France. Right? So this object was made over time. So I want to point out that this kind of belt area, this is the original thing that held the reliquary, uh, which is the bones of this young girl who was a martyr in the area, Santa Foy, or Saint Foy, right? So that was the original kind of part. And then all of this elaborateness around it was added over time. So just like today that tourism is a big money, tourism is outside money coming into a community, 
pilgrimages are outside money coming into a community. So that's one of the reasons why this object kind of grew over time and sort of has this layers and layers of elaborateness that go along with it is because money is coming in throughout time. Right? And this is the object that people are coming to see. So it makes sense that you would have that money drawn into that. And again, I don't want to make too much of a parallel between economy and art, but to say that those things are not related is kind of, you, you have to acknowledge the relationship between art and economy. Okay, this is the Church of Sante Foy. So let's break down some of the things that we see. We are currently looking at the asp. And I know that we haven't defined that word yet, but we will here in a moment. So we're looking at the asp. We see this kind of rounded shape, right? Very reminiscent of the rotunda from um, the Parthenon. And then we see these capitals, right? These column capitals. One thing I do want to point out is it's kind of like they wanted the window to be all the way up here into this arch, but it's like they built it and then we're like, oh, we can't get it that tall. So it kind of drops a little bit short. But there's all these arches, there's all these capital columns, there's this rotunda, very, very Romanesque. This is the interior of the building. I want you to, to point out a couple things. There's these column capitals here but it's like they're compound columns right the the actual column the actual stone pillar that holds up the building is very 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 thick but it's like they've tried to make it look smaller and thinner a little bit more roman by kind of making it four around one central one right you guys are kind of seeing that how that's happening if you look down here at this area it might kind of point it out a little bit better so there's that. There's an awesome use of the barrel vault there. All right. We are looking at the asp. So we're looking at that rounded rotunda section of the building that we were just talking about. These are those like little windows that looked like they wanted to be taller, but they couldn't. And I'll draw your attention to this window here. Look how thick that wall is. We don't even see the other side of the wall it is thicker than that visually right so that gives you a little bit of perspective or just kind of a slight glance at how actually thick these stone walls are and that will be important as we move forward so a couple key things are pointed out there so this church is built in what's known as the latin cross plan so that asp which i used that word a couple times is this kind of round section which basically is the head of a cross right these buildings were intentionally built with this shape in mind this cross shape they also intentionally point east right towards the holy land towards um jerusalem and the area where jesus was and lived and was born and all those sorts of things so that's very important so let's move on to the next slide this is the tympanum which is at the west portal so if the the latin cross plan is shaped like this with this being east this is where you enter this is in the western kind of part of the cross down here and this is what you would see as you would go into the church right? so we see some iconography again so remember those four evangelical guys who matthew mark luke and john and they were represented as like a calf and a lion and an eagle and a man at this time as we move forward in time they get other iconographical symbols to go with them which is the key and a book and a shield right this key is very important because it's what holds the gates of hell closed and that's what we're actually seeing a depiction of here if you look at this image it's almost like it's split right down the center like this and there's all this bad imagery going on on this side right there's some demon type creatures there's all these just badness right and there's an emphasis on 
hell as part of the afterlife. This very much so the, the theme or theory at this time that would be put forward was not that um, Christianity was not like super happy and it was you could be tipped at any moment into the into the fires of hell. And that's what we see here is we see all these people lining up for judgment. Right. And then we see Christ in the center and he's kind of got one hand going up and one hand going down. Part of his job as judgment day. Right. The up or down sort of thing. So a lot of iconography, a lot of visual imagery to unpack before you would even get into the church. This would be what you were presented with. Right. Again, most people were illiterate and that's a big part of the reason I keep saying that over and over again but i feel like sometimes it's difficult as people who are literate in the 21st century with the way information is constantly at us and upon us and you're in college now all those kinds of things it's it's difficult to imagine what life would be if you were not literate and if most people that we encountered were not literate so this is a diagram of that tympidum Right, so it's still using post and lentil construction. Right there, we see that lentil, right, and that's part of where kind of the two sides of the image are. Right? So next, we're going to move on to Gothic style, and this means barbarous German style. Gothic in today's popular culture doesn't really have the same. Um, kind of a punk rock and roll type of thing nowadays but it didn't mean that initially so this was developed in northern france and then it spread um through western europe so we're going to talk about the architecture of these buildings and exactly what that meant to physically interact with them so these buildings had increased height. They were some of the tallest buildings ever constructed at the time. It's stained glass windows. And the use of stained glass windows came about because of the way the vaults are arranged and flying buttresses. If you've never heard the term flying buttress before, be prepared to have your mind blown. So this is Chartres Cathedral in France, right? It has that Latin cross, um, plan. We know that this is the direction east, right? That's where the asp is, and it kind of has that cross um, design to it, so we know that would be east. And the big thing I want to point out to you, or I want you guys to kind of look at, is what are those things coming off of the building? These are not inside of the building. They're like these spider legs coming out of the building and going down to the ground. So those are actually the flying buttresses. Right? So this is the um, architecture of the inside. This is the Latin cross plan. Again, like I said, this is going to be east. Right? This is going to be west. West, there's a lot of um, terminology here. The big thing I want you guys to remember for the test is the term ASP. And then we'll use this term transept in the lecture, but I don't think there's any uh, test questions about it. So people always enter from the West. Right. These are the flying buttresses and how they look kind of like as a cross section. So you see them here in the smaller image up here. And what they're doing is they're taking this weight of the roof all right, and bringing it, let's get a different color for contrast, and then it goes down like this and then actually goes all the way out of the building and then down to the ground. So all of this interior pillars and whatnot, they don't have to be so thick. The walls of this building do not have to be as thick as the walls at Sante Foy. Remember I showed, I tried to point out how thick the window was and I was kind of like, see how small the windows are? And then you can get an idea for how thick the stone wall is. Because of these flying buttresses and because of these architectural innovations, that all goes away. So what does that mean for the inside of the building? This is the interior of Chartres Cathedral kind of um, at night. So we see all of this stained glass that's up here. 
Another thing I just want to point out is this is a pilgrimage site. So here it has this labyrinth, right, which is this circular thing on the ground here. And this is a kind of like a miniature representation of the pilgrimage path, right? So you would actually go in and walk this, right? And this would be sort of like the destination, but it would seem like as you were walking it, like you were getting farther away from your destination, right? As you kind of come to conclusions and whatnot in your, your walk about your spiritual journey. So this is actually the origins of the labyrinth are pagan, but they, symbolize the same things or the same ideas that this church kind of symbolizes or this idea of all these pilgrimage sites symbolizes. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the view of the asp and the transept of inside the building. So I want to do a little bit of that kind of like thought experiment with you guys where you imagine that you are a person living in this gothic era, living in the sort of end of the Middle Ages, right? You don't have any light bulbs. The only light that you've ever seen in your life is the light from the sun and then the light of a fire, right? So which is a very inconsistent flickering light that would be inside of your house. You probably don't have glass windows in your house. So more than likely, in the winter time and whatnot, all your windows are closed by shutters and you just have the light of that fire. And then all of a sudden you're able to go inside of this enormous building where light streams in and it's multicolored. So I want to take a moment to talk about um, the kind of ways in which people interact with arts. So there are three basic ways that art and you interact with each other. So the first is kind of this very close, intimate way, right? So this is a handmade cup by, not me, by another artist who I really like. And I interact with this object in a very intimate way. I touch it, I feel it. I actually drink from it, right? It touches my mouth, right? So things like jewelry falls into this category. Things like um, clothing and knitting. If you or your mother or your grandmother or whatnot maybe sewed blankets, right? My grandmother was a quilter. So th that object interacts with me on a physical level. Right? And all those same choices of the design, of the color, all the principles and elements of design are still going into those objects, right? They just have this intimacy with you and your body i say intimacy and maybe i don't know you're probably all laughing under your breath but you know what i mean there's this physical connection between you and said object a lot of the times this zone of interaction gets kind of caught up in craft right but things like musical instruments would fall into that oh there's all kinds of things that fall into that category. But like I said, sometimes they're relegated to the zone of craft. The next level is a visual and intellectual level only. And this is when you're looking at a sculpture, you're looking at a painting, there is a physical distance between you and said object. So you are only interacting with it visually and sort of mentally. All right, those are the only ways that you're interacting. It's never, you never feel its texture or anything like that. You can see its texture and imagine it, but you never actually touch it. And the third realm that you can interact with artwork is the realm of architecture, where you cannot process the entire thing in one moment, right? Because it is bigger than you, because it engulfs you. Walking into it is one thing. Moving around with inside of it is one thing. Anytime, if you guys have ever gone on a field trip to a large museum, or if you regularly attend like a, a, a massive church like this or something like that, you've experienced this in your life. You've gone to a building that's sort of like bigger than you and you can't quite take the whole thing in in one moment, right? That's how it's different than that 
intellectual level where you look at it and you look at the whole thing at one moment, like a painting or something, right? So those are the three basic realms in which we interact with artwork. And this building is like the monumental way in which it can completely change how you feel, right? Because it is so large, because it's interacting with you on so many levels. Imagine how it sounds when you walk into a building that has a really high ceiling. Like if you ever walk into the gymnasium alone or something, the sound of your footsteps is different. Everything is different in this place, in this moment. All right, and it also has the use of stained glass. Because of those flying buttresses and whatnot, there's this ability to have these thin stained glass windows, which again, lets so much light in, light that has images of um, martyrs and Christian sort of symbolism on it, all of these people down in this area. This is the rose window, which is on the west transept, both from the exterior and the interior. So there's also this, when you look at this building from the outside, obviously it's beautiful, but there's a difference being inside and being outside, right? Which I think lends to that response that you have as a person, right? There's just difference in being inside, right? There's also this religious kind of like, you know, it's linked to this religiousness, being inside of the building has this religiousness and being outside it's not, so that that's kind of tied into that. So let's now talk about this area, which is where you first enter. And we're gonna talk about some of those tympidums. Again, this is getting along. All right, so this is the West uh, Royal Portal, right? So here we have Jesus in this tympidum in the center, right? He's obviously the hierarchical scale and he is surrounded by those four evangelicals kind of in that old school, old school, um iconographical way right the lion and the uh calf and the eagle and the man so matthew mark luke and john are all kind of flanking him and then below that there's this kind of line which represents architecture right all these arches and then these are all martyrs and saints depicted here and then let's go down here and check these folks out so these are the king and queen columns. So these are kind of the figures that are closest to you as you enter this space, right? And these would be um, kings and queens who have come before, obviously, right? So kind of like your ancestors, potentially, that sort of thing. And they are depicted as almost like part of these columns, part of these buildings. I love that they have these kind of downward pointed feet right these are people who have passed away so they have this elongation to them right which is kind of gives them this ghostly figure right they're stretching their feet at one point in time were on this world right you kind of imagine that you're standing here you're probably really tall right and then you're looking up at them and they have this kind of elongation and then as you look up at them, you're getting closer to looking up at these saints and thus being closer to looking up at these sort of divine figures. So it's this sort of visual leading of your eye up to the divine figures, which is kind of ultimately what you're trying to lead up to via your spiritual journey or whatnot. So there's a lot of subtle things that are constantly bringing your eyes and constantly bringing your attention up right, which is theoretically where the sacred realm is, right? So this art is making you do things that you didn't even, like they happen without your knowledge, right? This kind of constant looking upwards and whatnot. And that's part of what art can do, especially art like architecture. Okay, I'm gonna leave you guys with this last question. So how could art in, two dimensions, right? So art that we kind of see from a distance, right? How could it ever equate to what the Gothic style architecture could do? How could it ever have an impact on you physically, make you change your shape, make you look up, the sounds, the sights of all of the stained glass? How could that ever compete with other artworks? 
How is this not the pinnacle of artwork? So this, how does this evolve into the Renaissance, which is what we're going to be talking about next in the next unit. So I leave you with these kind of open-ended questions, which we will obviously answer later, and then please take the test and um, there check if there is a discussion and whatnot, and I will see you guys in the next lecture. Email me if you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. Don't forget the key terms. Email me if you don't know what any of these mean. They will probably likely be on the test. Thanks again.